Good morning, everybody. Everybody looks like they're in pretty good shape after last night. That's good. Um, welcome back. Um, don't have a lot to say this morning, except as people are coming in with suitcases, feel free to put them in the closets back there or there, and we'll make sure somebody's hanging out over lunch uh, that, that nobody's going to wander off with things. So um, that's one bit of housekeeping. The other is we do have a schedule change today. So um, Christian Landry, unfortunately, is ill. Um, not too serious, I trust, um, but um, couldn't be here. And um, uh, also, we have an addition. So um, instead of starting the uh, after lunch session at 1.15, we're going to start after lunch at 1.30 um, with a talk from Mafalda Diaz from um, Debbie Marks's group. And um, so uh, just if you want to mark on your schedule, we're coming back at 1.30. So we have a little longer lunch today, but we're going to steal back some of your lunch at the beginning, not the lunch, but the time, uh, to do a photograph. So we'd like to do a group photo. So, so Andrew's going to remind you of this at the end of the first session, but please don't run off uh, right at uh, when we break at 11.45. Let's um, try to get a, sesh, uh, a photo out there in the atrium. We'll try to do something arty from above or something. Um, Anyway, uh, without further ado, let's uh, get to the, the session. Um, so uh, next, Feng Chen is going to come up and introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Thank you, Feng. Good morning. Uh, I'm Feng Chen from Illumina. I have really enjoyed the meeting so far, and I hope you do too. And I'm gr glad that Illumina has the opportunity to sponsor such an exciting and uh, high caliber meeting. So to kick start today's sessions, I'm honored to introduce you uh, our today's keynote speaker, Dr. Douglas Fowler from the University of Washington, where he's an associate professor of uh, genome sciences and an adjunct associate professor of bioengineering. He's also a CIFA Israeli global re uh, scholar Doug earned his PhD in chemistry at the Scripps Research Institute, where working with Dr. Jeffrey Kelly and Dr. William Bouch, he discovered and characterized the first mammalian functional amyloid protein following a postdoc fellowship with Dr. Stanley Fields. He began his independent career at the University of Washington. He has focused on developing and implementing new technologies to address difficult genomics uh, problems. He is a leader in high throughput sequencing-based assays, and his lab has deep expertise in large-scale experimental approaches and also computational analyses. He is now working to understand the effects of the millions of uh, variants found in a typical human genome. The title of his talk today is, What Do We Need to Scale Multiplex Assays to All Genes in the Genome? Let's give it up for Dr. Fowler. Uh, hi, oh wow, those are bright lights. Um, thank you so much, Fung, for that um, wonderful introduction, and uh, thanks to Fritz and everyone in the Toronto crew, as well as all the su support folks who've made this just a really um, amazing, amazing meeting. I'll admit that this is my first meeting um, in person since, well, a long time ago, uh, so I'm a little nervous, uh, more than usual. Um, but it's really, it's really great to be here, uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to tell you uh, a little bit about some of the science that my lab is doing and share um, at least my thoughts on uh, what we need to do as a community to get to the place where we've, you know, assessed all the variants and all the genes that we think are, uh, that we think are important. Um, and I know that's a, it's a goal many of you share and we're excited about, so it'll be fun to, to talk about. Um, before I get into the science, I, I do just want to uh, uh, say that I'm really pleased that this meeting has sort of continued and grown. Um, I can't take credit for starting it. It's actually two individuals, um, Eliza, who's uh, the, 
person responsible for the tweet up top, and then Liv, the individual who's standing in that, in that uh, bottom photograph, who helped organize the first one of these in Seattle uh, four years ago, and um, did a fantastic job and got a great local crew, and then with the support of the Brotman Beatty Institute, uh, made it into a pretty big local meeting, and then um, eventually a meeting where people started coming, and now it's a thing that it was Fritz's great idea to sort of set the meeting free and have it be, uh, you know, have it move around and not be organized by the Seattle crowd, which is great because it's a lot of work um, to do, and it's fun to just like come and, and see everybody without having to do um, a ton of work. So uh, anyway, that's just a little bit um, about the meeting, and, and hopefully will continue. Um, so my personal motivation for uh, thinking about mutational scanning is really this uh, observation that was very surprising to me and no surprise to you know, the, the human geneticists um, uh, that I excitedly told about the, <laughs> this, this discovery that I had made, which is that if you, if you, you know, just take the human mutation rate, um, de novo mutation rate, you can work out that there are something like 50 instances of every possible single nucleotide variant uh, out there among people alive today, um, except the ones that are, that are um, incompatible with life, of course. And uh, that means you know, that if we think about genomics from a sort of large-scale population perspective, we'll have to deal with every possible variant that uh, you know, can, can occur. We'll eventually observe them all. But we won't observe them uh, enough times to really be able to make strong inferences about what they do just based on phenotype alone, at least for some of them. And um, of course, the vast majority of them will be completely benign, but we'll still find them when we sequence genomes, and they'll still be a problem uh, when we try to understand uh, what an individual's genome or exome or genetic test result might mean. Um, in addition to this uh, problem, there's also all of the really amazing work that we heard about um, yesterday, sort of suggesting and showing how analyzing mutations can teach us a lot about proteins and genetic elements, and so um, for all those reasons, I guess I was I'm sort of really fascinated by the idea of scaling up uh, mutational analysis. But anyway, uh, just to, to make the point, um, which many others have made at the meeting so far, this, this problem uh, of, of having so many mutations in the human pop rare mutations in the human population, is already reflected in clinical databases like ClinVar, right, where we see a large number of variants of uncertain significance. And a lot of our work at the University of Washington in collaboration with Leah and others has been focused on really trying to develop technologies and show uh, that, that we can attack this, this variance of uncertain significance problem, at least in part, based on uh, um, the data we get from those technologies. Oh, and I should say, this is a large and growing problem, um, so it's not going away anytime soon. Um, so this is, this is, you know, by way of motivation, uh, what, you know, what, um, what sort of fires a lot of the work in my lab. Um, and just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page, right, the reason we're here is that we're excited by the idea that variants can be assayed together uh, in, a, in a multiplexed way. In my lab, we use uh, mostly cultured human cell lines, so cultured uh, human cell systems. Um, and uh, so if we make a library of variants, we can, you know, assay it in some, in, in some particular type of assay. Most of the assays that are used these days are cell growth assays, and, you know, we read out uh, a variant effects by sequencing, and that's great. Um, and cell growth assays, I would argue, are probably the cleanest type of assay we can do. They're very reproducible. We as a community understand how to do them really well. There are amazing modalities like saturation genome editing, base editing, and, and other types of technologies that can be applied to growth assays. Um, and they generate lots of clean data. Um, you can apply growth assays to many genes, but not all genes. And as somebody, and I, I'm sorry for forgetting who yesterday mentioned, they give you this sort of integrated readout of phenotype, which is neat uh, and, and often can capture all the ways or many of the ways in which, uh, many of the ways in which a variant can damage uh, gene or protein's function. But um, they're not, the, they're not the whole story. That's what I'm gonna try to argue uh, today. And, um, in my lab, we've been working on uh, uh, some additional technologies for assessing variant effects that we hope will join some of the other exciting new ways that we can think about um, analyzing what variants do, uh, including like, um, so, so the ones that I'm gonna talk about are a, a technology for analyzing secreted protein variants uh, and figuring out what they do um, on, a, on a molecular level 
and then a technology for going after how variants impact cell morphology, so pooled optical screening, and what that can tell us about, um, about variant effects. So that's the plan uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, and the, we're just gonna jump right in to talking about secreted proteins. Um, so the, 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 the protein that we chose to go after is factor IX. It's encoded by the factor IX gene and um, uh, inherited variants, uh, or de novo variants, in, in factor IX are the primary cause of hemophilia B. And so what you can see here is that um, the preponderance, the majority of variants that cause hemophilia B are uh, missense variants and that those variants are spread out throughout the gene uh, with the exception of this activation peptide region that we'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to in a minute. Additionally, the current treatment for uh, uh, hemophilia B is factor IX replacement therapy, so you get a recombinant uh, version of factor IX. So for all of these reasons, oh, and I should say that the majority of these variants are, um, or many of them are variants of uncertain significance, although there is a really good clinical test for whether you, your blood clots appropriately. So, um, so uh, for all of these reasons, we thought that factor IX would be a really attractive target for conducting a mutational scan. The only problem is that factor IX is a secreted protein. So if you use your favorite method, a landing pad or whatever, to try to express factor IX from uh, a cell, then it will just float away. Um, and so there's no genotype phenotype link and you can't, you can't do a mutational scan on factor IX uh, um, using current approaches. Well, and furthermore, about 10% of human genes encode secreted proteins. So this is a, a, you know, a general problem that, that needs solving. And you might say, well, Doug, I mean, come on, there's, there's, there's you know, ribosome display, there's yeast display, there's phage display, there's lots of technologies that could potentially solve this problem. And, and you're right, except that, um, you're right, except that factor IX, like many other human secreted proteins, requires extensive post-translational processing uh, during secretion in order to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so you can see that the protein is glycosylated, uh, and I'll draw your attention to um, the fact that it's carboxylated uh, on its N terminus in this GLA domain. Uh, it's a, a gamma, uh, 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 um, uh, it's, a, it's a carboxylation uh, event that happens and is sort of absolutely required for normal factor IX function. Uh, additionally, uh, in order to become an active serine protease and drive the coagulation or participate in the coagulation uh, 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 cascade, uh, uh, the protein has to be uh, proteolytically processed and this activation peptide has to be cleaved out. So a lot of processing is necessary. So what we did was develop uh, um, a protein display system that's compatible with mutational scanning. Uh, and it's, as protein display systems go, pretty standard. So we fused factor IX to a transmembrane domain and a linker and had to do a, you know, a little bit of fiddling to make this work. But um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, variant encoding factor IX is, is uh, expressed from the genome and factor IX is, that variant is accessible on the surface for an assay. And the first set of assays that we've done uh, involve using fluorescently labeled antibodies uh, directed against various parts of the protein um, so uh, the light chain, the heavy chain, and the activation peptide, as well as uh, using an antibody that's um, specific for that particular uh, gamma carboxylation post-translational modification that I told you about. So we thought that these um, antibodies, uh, when we applied them to a library and used flow cytometry to sort out cells, would allow us to score variants for uh, both secretion and, and at least this particular post-translational modification. Okay, so um, this uh, uh, approach works pretty well. What I'm showing you here is a, is a, 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 a flow plot uh, of um, uh, cells either expressing factor IX in blue or not in red, stained with uh, one, of those, one of those antibodies. This one happens to be the heavy chain antibody. And you can see that we get nice separation. Um, so so we, we think that that means that you know, there's factor IX displayed on the surface of these cells, and in fact we can you know, see this for all of the antibodies that we were interested in, including that carboxylation, that post-translational um, modification-sensitive antibody on the right there. And the, um, the yellow curve is what you get when you treat cells expressing factor IX with uh, uh, the drug warfarin. And, and uh, warfarin inhibits the vitamin K cycle, which prevents this carboxylation. So um, we can also see that uh, from this plot that the, that the uh, factor IX displayed on the surface of our cells is, is post-translationally modified in the way that we would expect it to be, uh, and antibody can see that. So that was good for us. We were happy, uh, and we moved on to assessing a number of a panel of variants 
uh, just one at a time to make sure that things were sort of working as we hoped. Um, so you can see uh, here a plot of um, individually assessed variants uh, with both the heavy chain antibody on the x-axis and the carboxylation antibody on the, on the y-axis, and wild type is up there in the upper right-hand corner, so that, that's good. Our warfarin control ha, ha, is, you know, is secreted but does not get carboxylated, and so we were able to look at a panel of uh, a number of variants that are known to be uh, either associated with hemophilia B or um, found in, in factor IX and were of interest to us. And there's a couple things that you can see here. Most notably that all of the blue points are variants that occur in that GLA domain that gets post-translationally modified, and many of them are, are thought to disrupt uh, the post-translational modification or are known to, and in fact, in our system, they do. So for all of these reasons, we were, uh, we were pretty confident that we were successfully displaying you know, full-length factor IX on the surface of cells, that it was uh, modified in the right way, and in fact, with some data that I'm not going to show you, we think that it's, it's, it's you know, properly folded and, and, uh, and, and possibly even functional. Um, so uh, you know, we did what uh, we'd hoped to do when we started working on this system, which was made a library of uh, uh, um, more or less all of the possible missense variants, um, synonymous variants and nonsense variants of factor IX. Um, cloned it into our um, landing pad system to express it in these cells, and then uh, analyzed it or, or sorted cells using facts uh, into you know, one of four bins. And this is very similar to the VAMP-seq workflow that um, we've published, right, where we just sort out cells into quartile bins, deep sequence each bin, and compute, um, in this case, a secretion score based on the distribution of cells across the bins. Um, and, uh, and so when we do that, we get this uh, secretion map for, uh, for the, the uh, factor IX protein. And I'm just going to show you today uh, data from the anti-heavy chain antibody uh, um, uh, experiment, although the experiments with all the other antibodies are either almost done or underway. Um, and so we're, we're excited to see what they uh, can tell us. Um, we've looked at a bunch of these sequence function maps already. Uh, uh, during the meeting, so I won't like reintroduce it, but I do just want to make the point that um, there are some really interesting things to notice about this map. Um, one is sort of the expected pattern of like columns, right, that, that show us where critical parts of the, um, critical parts of the protein fold or other fu uh, functional pieces that are required to get the protein secreted are, and one particular one that I'll draw your attention to is on the left here is the secretion peptide and the propeptide that are absolutely required to kind of get the nascent uh, polypeptide into the ER and then uh, have it be prof properly processed and trafficked, and, and there's um, some interesting stuff that we're learning about how these motifs work. Um, and what their functional constraints are. The other thing that, um, the other thing that uh, jumps right out at you is the fact that uh, cysteine substitutions really tend to screw this, this uh, protein up, uh, screw the secretion of this protein up, and they do that even in the central region of the heat map there, which is the activation peptide, where there are essentially no constraints uh, other than substitution to cysteine. Um, which we thought was, was really interesting and not something we'd seen. You know, we've done a bunch of experiments very similar to this, not for secreted proteins, but for uh, cytoplasmic proteins, and, and all, many of you have too, and, and we haven't seen this sort of pattern. So we were interested in, in digging a little bit deeper, and this is, these are just two plots showing you the effect of all the substitutions either from the indicated amino acid on the top or to the indicated amino acid on the bottom. And for those of you who are, you know, protein science aficionados, what you're looking for, particularly in the bottom plot, is, you know, that tryptophan and, and uh, proline should be kind of the most disruptive amino acid substitutions. And what you get instead is that cysteine is the most um, disruptive amino acid substitution. And in particular, if you're mutating, mutating from a wild type cysteine, that's almost always really, really bad. Um, and so what we think is going on here is that, you know, this is a, a protein that is um, held together by a number of disulfide bonds. And either, either introducing or removing a disulfide bond, we think, causes aberrant disulfide bonding um, during secretion, and that leads to, um, during synthesis and secretion, and that leads to degradation of the protein. So we're keenly interested in the sort of um, variants that don't behave in this way, so cysteines that can be mutated at the top of the top plot there, and then uh, cysteine substitutions that you, can't, you can make uh, without without screwing up the secretion of the protein. So we'd like to understand exactly how that 
the, these cysteines are um, causing this profound uh, disruption, disruption in secretion and why there are exceptions to the rule. So there's, we think, an interesting um, sort of biophysical and, and protein story here. Additionally, um, of course, we're keenly interested in how this data can inform, how this data can inform our understanding of hemophilia and, uh, and the variants that, that drive hemophilia. So these are just a pair of plots that show the relationship between our secretion scores on the x-axis. And either one of two measures that you get uh, that, that are captured in the clinic. So one is um, what is called antigen, and that's just the amount of factor IX in, that can be measured in, in plasma. And the other is activity, which is um, the activity of factor IX in a, in a clotting assay that's performed using uh, plasma from the, uh, from the, from the individual. Um, and so um, what you can see on the left is that we get a pretty nice relationship, I think, with um, factor IX antigen, uh, where if you sort of look, you can draw, maybe imagine drawing a cutoff but, um, uh, in our, in, on our secretion score um, distribution, you know, below which you would almost always also measure low antigen levels in uh, uh, an individual. Um, and so that's really, really nice, sort of what, I guess that was the primary thing we were hoping for. Additionally, you can see that um, most, but not all, of the variants that have high secretion scores also have high antigen scores. And that's also, you know, what we would expect, and we would expect that those variants that have, um, and so we're interested in knowing why the variants that have low antigen scores but high secretion scores uh, are that way. What we think may be going on is that uh, those variants, you know, they're secreted in our, in our assay just fine, but we think that perhaps they're either um, more susceptible to proteases in plasma uh, than, um, than, their, than, than other variants, and we can't capture that in our assay because we don't treat our cells with plasma proteases. Um, but we could, so we're interested to see if, if, um, if, if um, we can do that and, and perhaps understand those variants. The other thing that could be going on is they might bind um, partner proteins in plasma that prevent their degradation, and um, we think we can also potentially do that assay, right, by, by looking at um, partner protein binding. So we're hoping to sort of fully understand what's going on in this antigen versus secretion score relationship, but we, we already think things look pretty clear. Um, on the activity side, uh, it's a little bit, the relationship is, is a little bit less clear. Um, so well, the first thing to know is that all of the variants that we know about are uh, hemophilia B variants. They all have profoundly reduced activity, or at least reduced activity, and many of them, most of them have profoundly reduced activity. So we don't see a huge relationship there, and, and perhaps we wouldn't expect to, uh, given that we haven't measured you know, the, the, the catalytic activity of the protein, although that's something we'd also like to do, and I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, in any case, uh, in any case that's, that's, a, you know, that's, that's what we found. So um, another, a slightly different way to look at the clinical data is just to ask about disease severity, and these severity categories you know, are, are sort of clinically defined um, categories on the basis of uh, uh, measurements you can make. And what you see here, so what you see here are just box plots of the secretion score for all the variants that we could access um, in publicly available databases, sorted out by the, the severity. And here I think things look um, pretty promising. So we definitely see that the, you know, that there's a, a, a majority of mild, mild uh, uh, cases have variants that are secreted well, and the majority of uh, severe cases have variants that are secreted poorly. So while this isn't, you know, on the basis of this single assay, a perfect, um, uh, can't perfectly discriminate, we still were, you know, quite pleased with this result and think that the, the assay has, will have, end up having, you know, sufficient discriminatory power to be useful. Um, just like on the biophysics side, we're really interested in understanding what's going on with variants that have, you know, very low secretion scores but still mild, uh, uh, ca cause mild disease or very high secretion scores and cause severe disease. And, you know, all this data is pretty new, so I'm the first one to admit that, you know, there's lots of I's to dot and T's to cross before we can really understand what's going on. But we think, you know, just one of the powers of these assays, right, is they point out places you should look. Uh, uh, to find something interesting. So, um, so where are we headed next? Okay, so um, you know, we think that just with the assays that we have and data we have in hand, we'll be able to help resolve de novo variants in factor nine. Um, the, the gene has a pretty high rate of, of uh, de novo variants appearing, and we think that um, 
the type of prospective information that um, uh, mutational scans give might be useful there. Um, I've already showed you a little bit about how we've begun to rate the, relate the biochemical effect of variants, uh, in this case, how they fare in secretion to disease sever severity um, can, can be accomplished, and we think there's more to do there. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you can remember all, all the way back 15 minutes ago, um, the, 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 the therapy for factor IX uh, deficiency is um, replacement of, uh, of, of factor IX, of it's replacement therapy, so recombinant factor IX that's given. Um, and one thing that happens occasionally is uh, that people, individuals, will develop um, antibodies to that replacement therapy. And that's a really bad thing because then you can't get the, the, um, the best drug to, to uh, uh, you know, treat the hemophilia. And it seems to happen in a variant-specific manner. And so we're really under interested in understanding why it is that people develop those um, what are called inhibitors, antibody inhibitors of the, of the replacement therapy. Um, and then additionally, you know, the current therapy is recombinant uh, factor IX. The therapies that are coming down the, the pipe seem to be either gene therapies or cell therapies to induce the secretion of functional factor IX in individuals. And we feel um, pretty strongly that our data might be able to inform the development of those therapies, right, because we can already identify variants that we think are secreted um, um, better. Uh, than wild type, and we think that we'll be able to adapt the assay in ways that will allow us to perhaps engineer this protein in a useful way. Um, in terms of uh, how, where we would like to take the display system and assays for this protein, um, we'd like to go after uh, post-translational modifications. I mentioned the carboxylation one. I was hoping to show you data. We're very close, but we don't quite have it yet. Um, there are other uh, um, antibodies that we can use to read out other uh, features. Um, we want to go after enzyme activity using a strategy called ClickSeq that we developed in collaboration uh, with Matreya Dunham, Dunham's lab, um, where we use um, a, a mechanism-based or covalent inhibitor of the protein of interest, and there is one for factor IX, uh, and we modify that inhibitor with a fluorophore, and then we treat cells expressing our variant library with the fluorophore-labeled inhibitor, and the cells expressing active variants get labeled, and we can sort them out. Uh, and then also with binding partners, right, we can do a traditional fluorescently labeled binding partner assay. Um, and then, you know, we've already shown that this display system will work for other secreted proteins, and we'd like to go after uh, those, especially the ones of, of high clinical interest. Okay, so that's where we are uh, with uh, secreted proteins. We feel we've established um, a system that works well. Um, I didn't tell you about a lot of the details, but it's in a, it's in a um, suspension cell line, so that's really nice. It has, it has some, some other nice features that we think will make it um, useful and scalable. Um, we're also really keenly interested to see where we go with factor IX. Uh, what I'd like to do now is spend the last um, bit of time, 15 minutes or so, telling you about uh, a, another technology that we've been working on um, now for a long time, because it turned out to be really hard, uh, for uh, pooled optical screening of, um, of, of cells. Okay, so, um, you know, we know from lots and lots of really nice work, uh, including um, arrayed screens, that if you make genetic perturbations to uh, cells, and here when I say cells, I'm again talking about, you know, cultured human cell lines or cultured human primary cells or any cell you can mess with uh, and, and grow in a dish, um, you can produce uh, morphological heterogeneity that relates to the variants that you express, whether that's gene knockouts or protein variants or whatever. Um, and the challenge has been, so we have this, all of this, ooh, geez, wow. don't love, I don't love this thing. I, it's very hard to look and talk. And, anyway, um, I'll try not to throw this at anybody, but sorry if I knock somebody out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we have this very nice, we have this, I guess, yeah, gesturing. Anyway, we have this very nice um, uh, um, set of technologies for doing arrayed screens, right? You can buy a um, box that will let you grow cells and you know, image them in a 96 ball plate format and, and analyze their morphology. And, and, and that has worked really well, um, but there's a scaling problem, right? Which is that if you are thinking about doing you know, tens of thousands of variants, of thousands of proteins, um, it, becomes, it, it becomes challenging. So there's you know, an interest in trying to develop um, op pooled optical screening technologies where we can take our pool of cells and uh, figure out which cells express which variants. And um, there are a number of, of solutions to this problem. I'll talk about in situ sequencing uh, uh, later. The way that we decided to solve this problem is actually inspired by a conversation with Sri, I don't see where he is, but he, uh, a long time ago at a meeting, 
um, uh, gave us this idea, and it was a good idea, uh, I think, to try to take uh, and come up with a way to take, take uh, cells that had your morphology of interest and be able to sort of isolate them, and then you could sequence each pool of cells that had a particular morphology and figure out which uh, variants were driving that, uh, the, the, the formation of that uh, cell morphology. And so we came up with a, a tool that we call visual cell sorting. We published this a couple of years ago uh, and used it to do just a very small pooled optical screen of a, of a nuclear localization sequence. But in case, um, in case you haven't read the paper, uh, and who has time to read papers these days, um, I'll tell, just introduce you very briefly to the technology. Um, so it brings together automated microscopy and fluorescence activated cell sorting with two other um, uh, um, tech techs that, are, uh, uh, um, that I'll explain just so we're on the same page. So the first of those is a digital micromirror device. This is a, 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 an array of very small mirrors that can be switched on or off. And if you put that in the light path of a microscope, then you can produce any pattern of illumination that you want, right, by switching the mirrors on and off. And uh, just to drive the point home, uh, these mirrors are really tiny. So this is, this is an image from our um, microscope where you can see a human cell nucleus there and a one pixel of our DMD uh, in our microscope. So you can illuminate any cell or subset of cells or set of organelles in cells that you want using, uh, using this, uh, 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 this approach. So we can illuminate cells that we're interested in. To record that illumination and allow us to fish cells out that we're interested in later on, we use a photoconvertible fluorophore. And um, we either use a photoconvertible fluorescent protein, like is shown here, or a photoconvertible dye that's attached to um, an antibody if we want to work with fixed cells. So uh, these fluorophores set out life as, uh, as green, and if you irradiate them with a little bit of UV light, they, they change from green to red. Um, so you can record the illumination event that, uh, of the cells that you're interested in, uh, in as a green to red change. So you bring all this together and you get visual cell sorting where you start with a library of, uh, of variant expressing cells that have distinct morphologies that you're interested in. We developed a, a pipeline that I'll tell you about for analyzing images. Um, that allow us to classify cells according to their morphology. Then you just zap the cells you're interested in with a little bit of UV light, you turn them red, you tell the microscope to do that for tens of thousands of fields of view or thousands of fields of view containing millions of cells, and the microscope does its thing, and then you use facts to sort out the cells that you're interested in. And you can encode um, multiple bins or multiple types, phenotypes, in the, the amount of Dendro2 activation, or you can encode like a continuous phenotype. Um, by separating it into bins, uh, just by zapping cells for different amounts of time. So that's visual cell sorting. Um, the, the gene to which we decided to apply visual cell sorting after we got done with the nuclear localization sequence is laminae. And laminae was interesting to us for a number of reasons. So first of all, its, um, its function inside cells is to, it's one of the primary proteinaceous components of the nuclear lamina. And it sort of serves as a, as a, it's thought as a physical connector between DNA and chromosomes inside the nucleus. So it's thought perhaps to have play a role in um, chromosomal segregation to the nuclear envelope and thus gene expression, and, and the cytoskeleton, right, and the mechanical forces that cells are under. Um, so that's fascinating all on its own. Uh, but additionally, uh, germline variants of, of laminae can cause a number of different uh, diseases, principally cardiomyopathy. Uh, and also muscular dystrophy, which, you know, seem related. Um, much more rarely and disputedly, a fat-wasting disease called lipodystrophy. Um, and then, ag additionally rarely, but not disputedly, a, a premature aging syndrome called progeria. So we were really interested in this phenotypic pleiotropy, and further um, excited by the fact that um, if you take patient fibroblasts, uh, and stain them, look at where their laminae is in these, in these patient fibroblasts, you can see that um, in wild type uh, uh, individuals, it sort of has this nice smooth um, uh, um, presence throughout the nuclear lamina, but um, in pathogenic variants, you get this speckling or fo focal or um, um, aggregation pattern. And so there's a, a nice phenotype that we thought we would want to, we would go after, that we, wanna we wanna, wanted to understand. So we set up a, um, we set up a system for, doing, uh, for, for assessing that phenotype at scale using, uh, using uh, visual cell sorting where we express laminae from a landing pad uh, uh, and it's fused to MIRFP so we can visualize it and wild type looks like that in the upper left where you see that most cells have this kind of smooth wild type-like appearance 
And then pathogenic variants, some pathogenic variants, but not all pathogenic variants, have this very profound aggregation or uh, uh, focus forming phenotype. Just to sort of show you quantitation of the images I, I, I just showed, you can see that, um, you can see that it, it seems that the cardiomyopathy and muscular dystrophy variants are the ones that drive this, this, uh, focal, um, this focal pattern, but maybe the variants uh, associated with other diseases don't. And we haven't tested enough variants, the field hasn't tested enough variants to really know, but this is the question, one of the primary questions we like to answer with our scan, right, is does this phenotype, you know, presage, um, or is it related to uh, uh, cardiomyopathy and muscular dystrophy only, or uh, what's the relationship basically between this phenotype and, and disease? So um, when we, when we uh, made all this sort of work to our satisfaction, we cloned a library of laminae variants, and we've assessed about 5,000 of the possible 10,000 or so variants so far. This is just an image from the library, and you can see that cells have you know, different phenotypes because they express different variants. Um, so what we did was, you know, oh, and so before we, before we get there, I have to tell you about the one, one of the very hard thing problems that we had to solve to get this technology to work. So, Visual, in a visual cell sorting experiment, right, your microscope takes a picture of a field of view, um, and then you have to analyze that, that picture in real time. Right? You can't analyze it after the experiment is done. You have to analyze it in real time because you have to tell the microscope which cells you want to activate before it moves to the next field of view. So the um, image has to be segmented to find where the cells or nuclei that you're interested in are. Uh, and then you have to classify, develop some way to classify the image of each uh, nucleus as either being, in this case, punctate or wild type like, right? So um, you gotta build a tool for doing that. And then you have to make a, a, a bitmap or a mask that, that says where all the cells that you wanna activate with your or zap with your UV, your UV laser are. And you have to send that back to the microscope and the microscope has to do that activation and then it can move on to the next field of view. And remember, we're doing tens of thousands or, or tens of thousands of fields of view in a single experiment. So this process has to be fast. And um, it, it's too, we, you know, we don't, probably are not going to have a beer, but if we have, if we ever, if you ever see me and, and want to, know, to you know, ha, hear a tale, I can tell you about how, you know, we, we hired our, our microscope reps, a kid's hockey buddy's dad, who was a Microsoft dev, to help us write the, the software that was required to like tunnel into the commercial microscope control software and do this quickly. Um, and it worked, and I now have huge respect for people who do hardware-related um, research projects, hardware development-related research projects. But we made this all work, um, and to go with it, we trained a classifier, that uh, a neural network-based classifier that can take uh, images of, of our, um, can take images of our cells and, uh, and correctly classify them with about 95% uh, or so accuracy into the either punctate or wild type like uh, classes. And um, we did that using um, transfer learning and the ResNet 34 um, framework that had already been developed with a fairly small number of, of training examples. So we think this is a robust pipeline that we can now use, not just for this phenotype, the reason I'm saying this is we can go after not just this phenotype, but sort of any phenotype that we can see by eye and, um, and uh, train a classifier for, because we've built all, all the software that we need. Okay, so at this point, like I said, we're about halfway done with Lamin-A. We have um, a sequence function map that uh, we haven't had for very long, so I don't have too much to say about it. It does have a few interesting features, so you'll note that like green box on top. So, oh, okay, so I should back up and say the way that we got this data is we sorted ourselves, right? We, we did visual cell sorting, we sorted ourselves into either the, the, um, the red bin, like we turned the cells red because they were punctate, or the green bin, we didn't. We deep sequenced each of the two bins and computed a morphology score that captures uh, whether the cells expressing that variant were found mostly in the punctate bin or the not punctate bin. And red here means um, wild type like, and blue means punctate. So uh, now I can tell you that that little green box up top is a loop that connects two uh, uh, folded domains. And you can see that the substitutions there tend to, tend to um, not affect morphology. Tend, the, the, those cells carrying those variants tend to have wild type like morphology. Uh, with the exception of that one like blue stripe, and it turns out that we think is actually um, a critical part of a turn in that loop that can't be mutated. Um, so we think there's all sorts of fascinating things we can learn about the, the, the protein, um, which does assemble into these um, multimers in the, in, the, in the nuclear lamina, 
uh, and we're also working to understand what these data can tell us about the clinical, um, the, the clinical phenotypes. And I don't have that analysis for you today. I will just say that, so this is just a replicate correlation between you know, two replicates of this pipeline. And for those of you who do growth assays, you will look at this and say like, oh man, garbage, what's that guy been up to? Um, but let me tell you that if you wanna do pooled optical screening, this is about, so this is, this is better than we think any reported pooled optical screen. And it's also pretty much the largest pooled optical screen. There are a couple of um, genome-wide CRISPR screens that have been done in a pooled way, so they're a bit larger, but um, we're really proud of this data and, and it's actually more reproducible than, than what else is out there. Um, so we're, you know, we're really happy with how this, this, um, this, this screen uh, uh, came out. So as I said, we don't have the analysis of this experiment in the context of the clinical data, but we did do a smaller pilot experiment that we have analyzed, and I'm just showing you this to show you that, um, that, that the three known pathogenic variants that were in this um, smaller screen um, do sort out uh, in a way that we would call them as um, altered, altered function in, in the assay. So we're excited about where this can go. Uh, and we think that, uh, we think that there's, there's lots of utility for this method. So where are we headed here? Well, we're gonna finish the map. Um, we have all the analysis in front of us. Um, we've also started working uh, to validate some of these results in, um, in uh, cardiomyocytes derived from IPS. And that's what you see there. It's just an um, image of laminae expressed in cardiomyocytes, either wild type on the left or one of the variants we predict to be pathogenic. Uh, on the right, and you can see we get this nice speckling pattern or aggregation pattern. So we, we think we can validate um, in that context. We'd also, so we think that this assay will be generative or this data will be generative of variants that we think will be really interesting to go after by RNA-seq to assess transcriptional effects, right? Because we would love to understand more about how this really critical protein drives um, uh, um, uh, gene regulation. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've taken up in situ sequencing, which is a fantastic method. Uh, that will allow us to discover new phenotypes um, that uh, that laminae variants uh, uh, can drive. So that's where we're headed. Uh, that's where we're headed with this project. So just to take the last couple of minutes to sum up, um, the vision that that I have right is that we should um, move towards. Thank you. Move towards um, a a place where we have functional data for every variant, at least every you know, single nucleotide variant in at least every disease-related gene, in at least the human genome. But I think as we get better at this, you know, we can actually think about like all the human, the, all the human genes and maybe a lot of genes of other organisms too that we can scan and really add like a layer of richness to our understanding of, of the human and other genomes. Um, and to do that, not just for any one assay, right, or any one type of functional data, but to really develop a rich understanding of the mapping between, you know, DNA variants and the molecular morphologies that they alter, the cellular morphologies that they alter, and how all of that relates to organismal morphology, right, or human disease. Um, I think that's the opportunity that we have and we should grab. Um, so what do we need? I mean, obviously we need scale and money, right? So if anybody has money, maybe consider giving it to us. Um, but no, but and there, there are people working really hard, right, to make these technologies cheaper and faster and more scalable. And I think we've done a good job as a community, right, convincing others that this is a problem we're solving and that it should be funded, right? But we could do more in that space and we should. Um, Additionally, right, we've been pretty much focused on synonymous, or sorry, single nucleotide variants or missense variants, and those are great, and there's a lot of room left to run. But um, as we saw, you know, uh, from Holly's talk, um, multiple variants can be interesting, and in other people's talks, multiple variants can be interesting too. And so we should think about how technologies like base editors or maybe other technologies can be used to analyze how multiple variants interact. Uh, there are larger genetic variations than, than just uh, single nucleotide variants, and the technologies for going after those are at a really early stage compared to where we're at for single nucleotide variants, so we can think about developing methods in those spaces. I think that we need to go after more contexts, right? Development is one that I'm really interested in, because I think that, you know, there are things that happen between cells and within organs that we can't recapitulate with, you know, by just analyzing cells in a dish. And again, we have a lot of room left to run for cells in a dish, so I'm not knocking that, but just saying that's an opportunity for development. And then, um, you know, there's been incredible work done in the modeling space, but um, lots, lots more to do there, too. 
Um, and then lastly, I think, and those of you who know me know, knew that this slide was going to be in here, um, but I think we should try to work together and work um, uh, collegially as much as possible, right? Because A, it's more fun, and B, it's more effective. And so, you know, the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance is one avenue for that. Um, there are other consortia and alliances that have gotten going that are at least tangential to the problem that, um, that I talked about. And then as a community, we've built this great set of, of tools and databases and, and um, you know, those will only live if we all like invest in them, right? But I think it's worth it because, um, you know, that's what makes the data we generate useful and transparent to other communities, right? If, if the data is like locked up in PDF supplementary tables, then like maybe it was great for your paper, but no one can use it and that helps, that helps only you and nobody else. So um, with that, I'll just say thanks to the amazing, fantastic team that uh, I get to work with. Um, in particular, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to call out Nick Pop. I think he's somewhere in the audience. Uh, he's the student, the MD-PhD student, who led the Factor IX work, and that was a, a, a deep and wonderful collaboration with Jill Johnson um, and Carrie Lanner in, in her lab, uh, John Sheehan and, and others. Um, and I, I have to also mention Rachel Powell, who's a fairly new RA in the lab, but who's just a powerhouse and has helped Nick um, just crank out and do a bunch of amazing science. Um, Visual cell sorting was originally the brainchild of uh, Nick Hasla, who's um, now back in medical school. Actually, he just left medical school um, to start his residency. Uh, and the person who's, uh, the people who've done all the work that I showed you are Suram Pandyala, who really put his shoulder into solving the computational and image analysis problems uh, that we could not have solved otherwise. Uh, and were, were hard problems to solve, even as well as we've solved them. And Hyunjin Kim, who did a lot of um, technical work and development on visual cell sorting to make it work with fixed cells. Uh, and that was a huge unlock, even though maybe it doesn't sound like it. Um, so those are, the sort of, those are the sort of key players of the work that I showed you today. Um, I'll additionally acknowledge Lara Muffley, who organized the last go of this meeting and has been a great um, project manager uh, in the lab and, and uh, for other efforts. So um, with that, I'll say thanks. And hopefully, I have some time for questions if people have them. Questions and then uh, don't go away, Doug. After that, um, I think okay. we have, maybe we can start with a couple online questions. Uh, sure. All right. Uh, first online questions from uh, Needy. She says, "Really nice talk." Um, wants to know if the uh, change in fluorescence from green to red um, after UV exposure is uh, um, reversible or irreversible, but and how long do you need to expose the cells? That's a great question. I should have said it. The, the, um, the fluorophores that we use undergo irreversible photochemical reactions. Like, oh, there's um, irreversible photochemical reactions. So you can't go back from green to red. With that said, of course, cells will, if they're alive, continue to divide and continue to synthesize protein. Um, so one of the nice things about visual cell sorting is you can do it on live or, or fixed cells, but if you do it on live cells, you have about a 24-hour window in which to do the experiment. Otherwise, the cell division and synthesis of new dendro 2, of the, of the new fluorophore, will start to, um, will start to uh, soften the, bear, the, the uh, separation between different levels of activation. How long do we activate? I believe the current activation times are 50, 200, and 400 milliseconds, or 50, 200, and 800 milliseconds. Um, so it's a, it's a not inconsiderable amount of the, so the cycle time per field of view is roughly three seconds. So it's a not inconsiderable amount of time. Um, I will just lastly say, in case you're wondering, that we did a fair amount of um, experimentation uh, to demonstrate that that amount of UV radiation is not toxic even to live cells. So we looked by like standard, you know, anexin staining and just, you know, cytotoxicity assays, and also we did an RNA-seq experiment uh, in the first paper where we showed that the whole pipeline, so zapping them with 800 milliseconds of UV and sorting them, produced like no significant um, genes at an FDR of 0.1 compared to, to unmessed with cells. So that's what we know. Yeah, really nice talk. I have a quick question on the lamin uh, story. Like, so when you see these puncta, have you gone in and characterized whether they are like more Again, thinking on the phase separation idea, but maybe more liquid-like or more aggregate or some quick assays that could be done on We have done, person. you know, we have done nothing. And if you're interested, since we're IGVF buddies and we have to do, do stuff together, and we want to, um, it would, we would love to pursue, you know, follow-up 
um, assays. My lab's not good at any of those assays, so I would love to talk more about what you think might be possible there. Um, but no, we haven't, we haven't done anything like that. Next question is from uh, William. He says, amazing follow-up from the paper a few years ago. Um, would love to hear about whether you do this on fixed cells or live cells. And then in parentheses it says, on the photo activation step. Yeah, so um, I sort of answered that. You can do it on either. So it works in both cases. Uh, in the fixed case, you don't have the complication that the cells are growing and making protein, so that's nice. You can put the, you know, you can put the plate in the fridge if you want. The experiments that I showed you were done on fixed cells, and I think that unless you really want live cells to do something with afterwards, and you can, if you're interested in, say, drug resistance, fish out cells that look a certain way and then grow them and hit them with drug again, um, the fixed cell experiments just work way better because you can take your time and you don't have this issue of the cells like doing stuff while you're trying to analyze them. Thanks. So, Doug, what do you think needs to be done to increase the modularity of these experiments? So, like, if you really want to scale up, um, say, the, uh, the uh, secretion experiments to a large number of different secreted proteins, like, how much trial and, like, right now, do you think, like, the, the trial and error that you need for like the expression construct and the mm -hmm. tether and other things like mm -hmm. that. Is, is that a major barrier? And, and similarly for the, um, you know, for, for the optical sorting, um, yeah. do you need to do things like tune promoter strength mm -hmm. um, for each individual uh, protein that you assay? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think there's a couple of different um, answer. So first I'll answer relative to the secreted protein assay, and I'll say that we've only tested one other protein, very similar to factor nine, and it worked right off the bat. But I can analogize to VAMPSeq, which is sort of the intracellular version of, of this, if you like. With VAMPSeq, it turns out there's not a lot of tuning that you need to do. Roughly half the things that you try in VAMPSeq work in one of the two sort of standard vectors that we clone into, and roughly half the things don't work and don't seem to be rescuable. Uh, and so I think the secretion assay is probably gonna turn out to be like that. Um, I think that expression level matters a little bit less for those types of assays because you're measuring like a protein autonomous phenotype, right? Like just, you know, is the protein present or absent? And you can overload the cell secretion machinery and you can get into trouble there. Um, we've had in a couple of cases to modulate expression, not by tuning promoters, but just by degrading the COSAC sequence. That's, yeah. uh, but I, I do think, so I do think there is some tuning, but I think it's tractable in those cases. I think the main barriers to scaling those technologies are the same ones that I think a lot of people are struggling with. That's how do we make libraries and how do we control their costs? How do we just deal with the volume of cell culture that is needed? Um, and the sorting is, a, is an additional, it's actually not really a huge time barrier, but it is a cost barrier, it's some, somewhat of a cost barrier. So I think the limiters on those side are more, much more sort of like just fundamental engineering type problems. On the visual cell sorting side, it's the wild west, right? I mean, what I learned uh, in, in, in executing that project in my lab is that cells do crazy stuff, right? So when you do a pulled optical screen, you have a lot of technical variation just from field of view to field of view stuff happens. Um, cell morphologies are density dependent, so that's a big kicker. Uh, when you grow them to be dense, they change morphology. Should have known that, but um, so I think there's a lot, and there are people who've gotten very good at that stuff, so Ann Carpenter and some of the Broad folks. Um, I know Miko Taipale here is working on these sorts of things. You can get good at it, but I, I think it takes a lot more uh, fiddling, and once you layer and there, additionally, there's no, I think, there's no good unsupervised, like the original idea for this approach, right, is we'll just take a library, we'll throw it on the microscope with some standard like cell painting type stains, uh, and we'll see what, what does the library tell us about the phenotype, right? But that requires having a good unsupervised method for discovering cell morph morphological phenotypes from images, and there is no such method that works super well. I think it's an active area of investigation and I hope that that's a, you know, that that becomes a possibility. But at the moment you still need this like bespoke, like you pick a phenotype or discover it in some laborious pre-screen kind of approach. Okay, thanks. So we're, I grab the mic just for a second. Oh, yeah. So sorry, 
sorry, we're starting to run into the next session. Don't okay. go away yet, though. OK. Uh, and, and you guys have been patiently waiting for a question. If you wouldn't mind either tackling Doug at lunch, or you can go on to Vimeo and pose the question there. And I'll ask Doug, because there are a couple of questions there. Sure. If you could go to Vimeo, sure. that would be great. But now I think Don't tackle me. Just tap me on the OK, no tackling <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. So, Oh, great. Thanks so much.